Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Welcome, everybody, this evening, this beautiful Sunday. Uh, we had rain last Sunday. We were meeting outside. Couldn't be better now that we're meeting inside. We'll see what happens next week when we meet outside again. Who knows? The Lord will keep us guessing. Uh, but I'm very grateful to be here with all of you. Let's say a prayer, and then Rob is going to lead our thoughts in communion. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you so much that you love us. And that in Christ, we can have life. In Christ, we can experience death to our old selves. In Christ, we can be reborn. And God, I pray that as we're here together, sharing communion, digging into your word, applying your word, and in fellowship with you and one another, God, help us to find new life and inspiration and to celebrate Jesus. Uh, be with us now. Speak through your servant, Rob, as he leads our thoughts in communion. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hello, Rob. Oh, right. Good afternoon. So, yeah, my name is Ron. Uh, so, yeah, it's my privilege to uh, share uh, some thoughts with you uh, tonight about me. Uh, question for you. Why do you think it's uh, so important that we remember the Lord's Supper? It's kind of an odd thing. You look over in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, where kind of Paul gives us a little bit of the template. I said to do this. Reading from the NIV, 1 Corinthians 11, starting verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord what I have also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, you, we've all kind of heard the scripture a bajillion times. It's all the secretary of the community. This is where Paul's body is how to do it. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you drink this bread, or you eat this bread and drink this cup, rather, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. So what, are we just supposed to remember Jesus? I mean, just just don't forget about me. When you do this, you'll remember me. Now, there's value in that for alone, for sure. I mean, in any way that we remember Jesus, that's always, I think, really helpful to us. But is it like... Don't forget what I did for you, you know, like a guilt trip kind of a thing. Like, don't forget the sacrifices, right? I mean, I, I don't think that's Jesus' style at all. That can't really be it. Do this in remembrance of me. Well, there's got to be something we're prone to forget, right? There's got to be something. I mean, I think all through the Bible, the Bible is replete with mechanisms to help us remember. Whether it's various, you know, rituals or traditions or just the scriptures themselves and the admonition to continually read them, pray do what we're doing now, get together, um, have worship together. We're prone to forgetting because I, I wonder sometimes like, well, okay, well, I definitely believe that Jesus came in bodily form, was crucified, died, buried, raised on the third day in bodily form, and was fully divine. Isn't the fact of that occurrence enough? It's like it happened once. Isn't that like good? And then you got baptized. You got to participate in that death, burial, resurrection. So you're connected with it and like, you're good, right? Well, yeah, but would you grow if you just did that to say like, okay, the fact of the crucifixion and resurrection happened, I participated in it, box is checked. Jesus did, I'm in, we're good. Well, I think we, you know, technically, yeah, but I don't think we would grow anywhere, right? Um, let's look over uh, in Second Peter. I don't think it's done. Second Peter chapter one, starting in verse five, it says, For this third reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. It's a goodness knowledge, it's a knowledge of self control, it's a self control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, and your godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective. And unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he's nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. I think the key is in there, 
right? Mm -hmm. Like this, the remembrance that lets it grow. If we just kind of like check the box of the reality of the crucifixion and death and resurrection, good point. Do the baptism mm -hmm. like we're in, okay, but I just still carry that with me on a continual basis and need the constant reminder of at least weekly coming together and go, okay, Jesus literally stood there with bread and wine with the disciples, instituted this specifically so I would have some mechanism built in to hold on to the truth of the crucifixion and let its power transform me continually because it's a process. I saw, I was, I was had a, a full, you know, day. My, my day is not usually just full um, before uh, coming to church on Sunday afternoon. But then last stuff, I was driving around the country, I think Miles Burgess somewhere, and I saw a church. And, uh, you know, there's usually some kind of a sign from a church, a blurb about the sermon. Sometimes it's boring, sometimes it's kiffy. You know, I always like to read those and go, you know, you're kind of judging it a little bit. I saw this one, you know, and it says, faith is a journey, not a guilt trip. I'm going to see that thing. But that's kind of faith is a journey, not a guilt trip. You know, like this, this is not, you know, I can look at this scripture and go like, I'm missing most of those things most of the time, you know, I'm like, I guess I'm just blowing it, you know, I'm just, you know, it can get discouraged, be like, I don't measure up to that, because this is kind of a, a end state, like, this is what you keep aiming for, and it's always an admission, like, do these things increasing measure, like, work on this more and more, build on it, it's not like, oh, if you don't have all those things perfectly squared away, your faith just, you know, stinks, you know, but it's saying, if we're not growing in those things, it's probably because, we forget about we're cleansed from our past sin. That's why participation in communion is so important to keep remembering what Jesus did and let it transform us. That's, that's really what I wanted to share. Um, but that I just kind of saw that and I was like, oh, it's part of the why. You know, I think it's always it's always good to remember the why. It's not just like, well, it's a tradition, it's a Christian tradition, just to support church. It's what you do, you know. Okay, but why? Uh, so I really want, I really hope that. We can kind of think about that. Let it transform us. If that resonates with you, like you can kind of see those things and go, I don't quite measure up to all that. Be encouraged that you know it's part of a process, and communion is part of the way that we keep that with us, so that we can grow. All right, let's pray. Mm -hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we are so grateful to have Jesus as our brother, as our Savior, as our Lord, as an example. God, and as an atoning sacrifice for our sins, and that we, we got to participate in that sacrifice, God. Let us carry that, uh, let us carry that with us every day, and especially now as we meditate on, on what Jesus did and the effect that has on our lives to bring forgiveness and transformation. Let that change our lives as we carry it forward today in everything we do. Jesus. Amen. I uh, appreciate that reminder from Rob. Um, we're going to dive into our text for today. Uh, the title of our talk is On Prayer. And we're going to talk about prayer, in particular, from 1 Thessalonians. Now, we're closing out a whole series where we studied the writings of John, the Gospel of John, and then the Epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And we march uh, line by line, maybe not word by word every time, although most of the time, uh, through all of his writings. I think we got a great picture of faith and belief and love and light and all that John was trying to convey to us. And often, we will preach through an entire book of the Bible like that, uh, expository preaching. We follow the scriptures. Every once in a while, we'll do a topical sermon, and that's what we're doing today. Um, and then uh, maybe next week as well, and then we'll dive into another expository series. That's just sort of how we do it. Um, and, and sometimes it can be a little bit disjointed going from uh, communion to another message with other scriptures. But let me just sort of ease everybody's anxiety around that. It's all about remembering Jesus. Mm -hmm. Everything that we're going to read now, get into everything that Rob read and talked about, and it's, it's all about remembering Jesus in our daily lives and what that remembrance means to us and how we respond to that. And today, uh, what I want us to dig into and, and think about, and discuss, maybe even to talk about, is how prayer will be impacted by our remembrance of Jesus. So let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 21. And might I have somebody read that for me? Would somebody like to read 
those uh, few verses there. First Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 through 22. Great. Alan, take it away. 16 through 22. Correct. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all, hold on to what is good, and get every kind of evil. Great. Thank you so much. Now, uh, you may recognize this passage from many things, but in particular, I've referenced this several times in the last couple of months. Because this is a scripture that I'm wrestling with. This is a scripture that I'm trying to apply in my own life. And let me tell you, it's helpful, and I love meditating on something like this that calls me higher. It's also hard. The first command is rejoice always. And let me tell you, I don't always do that very well at all. And uh, Lauren, my lovely wife, who is the perfect partner God selected for me, you can tell her that I said that because she just left uh, not because I was speaking, I don't think, but um, reminded me that, you know, when we were telling the kids not to complain or be grumpy, but I'm walking around being grumpy, uh, it's not a great example. And I'm calling them to something that I'm not necessarily doing myself. Now, I might say I have my reasons uh, because I try to be pretty handy and I try to save money and I try to do all of my home projects by myself. And by the way, they never go as planned, ever, ever. Uh, and it might not even be my fault this time. Most of the time it's my fault. But this time, I don't think it is because it's the water pressure in our house and I can't figure it out. And it's messing up all of our appliances. And it's just so frustrating. And I'm not rejoicing in this current situation. I don't know if you can relate to that. I don't know what it is that's going on in your life right now that's causing you, tempting you to not rejoice. But I've got some stuff that I'm trying to work out and figure out how do I rejoice even when I feel frustrated, even when I walk around, man, tempted to feel grumpy. Because let's be honest, sometimes that can be my default mode. If you know me at all, you know that I can tend towards Grumpiness. Don't don't nod your head so enthusiastically, Daniel. Come on, man. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, if you know me, you know, I can tend towards grumpiness or whatever you would call it. That's what I would call it. And I read this and I think, man, I need to keep reading this scripture. I might need even to, to pray through this scripture. And let me pause for a second and just let everybody know this this is the last Sunday where we're gonna have sort of our small group. And, and we're all sort of a we're always kind of a small church, but in particular in the summer, we're a very small group. I actually like the summers because the room is much more intimate and we can get to know each other better. And we do a lot of stuff like out and about. It's a lot of fun and I enjoy that. By the way, there's a little plug. This Wednesday, we're not going to be meeting on Wednesday. We're going to be meeting Thursday from midweek out at Tussie Mountain Recreation Center. And they have batting cages and they have putt-putt, mini golf. They have a driving range if you're into that. Uh, they also have go-kart racing, and it's going to be open. And uh, we all, whoever wants to participate, can participate in that. Uh, so anyway, we do a lot of stuff like that during the summer. And so I love our smaller group. Uh, next week, most of the students will be back. And uh, it will be still maybe relatively a small group, but bigger than what it is right now. Um, and also, one of the things that I'm really looking to this coming fall is we're going to do a series all on prayer. All of our midweeks um, during this series are going to be focused on prayer. And we're going to do this series in conjunction with the Frederick, Maryland Church and also the Pittsburgh Church of Christ, our sister churches that are very near uh, and dear to us. And it's going to be led by a, a guy named Kit Cummings. And uh, I've actually known Kit for a long, long time because he's from Georgia. He's from my home state. And he travels all over the world and uh, does uh, really, really incredible things uh, with people who are in prisons. He's got a really fruitful prison ministry and also works with a lot of youth. And it's just a really faithful, inspirational kind of guy. And uh, so, so anyway, he's going to be leading virtually uh, all of our midweeks. We'll meet in person. He'll be virtual. But he also avails himself, makes himself available, almost like a prayer consultant to, to meet one-on-one -on -one with all of the churches uh, that, that he teaches. And so he's going to be available. Uh, there's a book that we'll get for the entire church that everybody can read that he wrote. And uh, he's going to work through with 
all of us, but also get some individual time with us. Help us learn to pray uh, the way that we see faithful people in, in Scripture pray. And maybe even learn to pray a little bit like him, because he prays for and experiences um, God doing incredible things in his life a lot. I say all that to say, we're going to focus a lot on prayer. Because I need to focus on prayer. And hopefully it's not all selfish. Maybe you all need to focus yeah. on prayer too. And Paul starts this section of the letter to the church in Thessalonica with rejoice always. Now I talk about how hard that is for me. He also says, pray continually. Okay, so if rejoice always is hard, pray continually seems like an impossibility. Because what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to be praying right now as I'm talking to you all? Well, maybe. Maybe kind of. Am I supposed to be praying while I'm working or writing or hanging out? With? Well, maybe. It de depends how you define prayer. Depends what you mean by prayer. So let's talk about communication. Let's think of prayer as communication. What are some of the ways, avenues, modes that you are able to communicate or be communicated with? That's a, that's a real question, not a rhetorical question. What are some communication modes that are helpful for you? Yeah, face to face, sometimes on the phone or Zoom if necessary. But yeah, just conversation, words. What else? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So not only facial expression, expression but body language is communication, is a form of communication. What else? Yeah, yeah, so through what you do, through your actions, you can communicate so much to someone else, the people around you, to your community, any other modes, forms of communication. Yeah, yeah absolutely, how you dress and uh, what you want to communicate with that, for sure, any other? Thoughts. Right. Writing letters. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great way to communicate. And sometimes those of us who are delayed processors actually can communicate more effectively writing a letter because you have time to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. All of these are ways, modes of communication. And if you think about prayer simply as communicating with God, then this instruction to pray continually starts to feel a little bit more realistic. Because through words and posture, body language and facial expression and actions, and even just your presence, you can communicate to God. And you can hear and feel and experience God communicating to you in so many ways. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Okay, if the first two were hard, this one seems impossible. Give thanks in all circumstances. However, I think they're probably related. If we can rejoice always and pray continually, we're going to have a lot to be thankful for because gratitude is simply a lens through which we see our lives, a lens through which we experience God and one another and fellowship and life. And then he goes on, Paul goes on, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's will is not, what was the, Rob, what was the phrase? It's not a guilt trip. It's a journey of faith. Yes. Yeah, I love that, and we'll for sure steal that. Um, but but I think that's absolutely true because God's will for us is to rejoice and pray and live in gratitude. That's how He wants us to experience relationship and connection to Him. That's how He wants us to experience life, uh, fellowship with one another, is through rejoicing and continual prayer and lots and lots of thanksgiving. And I can get on board with that kind of connection yeah. relationship to God. Let's look at another scripture that I think is going to give us um, a little bit of an insight into why God wants this for us. And this one is Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. And can I have somebody read this passage? Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Sure, Rob, thanks. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through heaven, Jesus is the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Great. Thank you. I don't know about you, but sometimes um, the sentiment that I have around prayer, the feeling that I have about prayer is that I should, or I need to, or when I really, you know, in a bind, right? I don't always desire to communicate with God. Just being honest. Sometimes I really do, and I can't wait for it. On a beautiful day, waking up early in the morning as the sun is rising and it's quiet, I can, I can really connect with God. But I don't always feel that. But I think God gives us, through the Hebrew writer here, some sentiment, some reasons that we could feel desirous to pray to God, to want to communicate and be communicated with. We talk a lot, uh, I talk a lot about how God is compassionate, and I love that. That's the very first quality that God says about himself in Exodus chapter 34. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. And there's a lot of people who research compassion, believe it or not, in academia, and they define compassion, those folks who are a lot smarter than me, as noticing, seeing suffering, whether in the world uh, in someone, or sometimes even yourself, you can have self-compassion, but compassion is defined as noticing suffering and then being moved to alleviate that suffering, always followed by action. Okay, so that's compassion. And God, that's the first thing he says about himself is that he is compassionate. So God sees us in our human condition and is moved to alleviate suffering. And that's what we see in Jesus. But there's another quality that people like to research that I think we see in what the Hebrew writer is talking about here. And it's not just compassion. I think here we see empathy. And empathy is different than compassion because empathy means understanding, understanding what someone else is feeling. Or in other words, walking in someone else's shoes. And what the Hebrew writer is saying here is the reason we can approach God's throne of grace with confidence is because Jesus walked in our shoes and yet was without sin. We walk in our shoes and sin all the time, unfortunately. And sometimes it's the big neon sins that everybody can see, and you're like, oh yeah, this guy is struggling. Sometimes it's the internal stuff. The incredible thing about Jesus is he walked in our shoes and yet was sinless. And because of that, he can empathize. He can understand everything that we're going through. And because he understands what we're going through, we can feel motivated, excited, desirous to connect with God through him, through his empathy and understanding for each one of us. If you're talking to someone who you feel like is just on a totally different level than you, mentally, emotionally, or whatever else, sometimes there can feel like a disconnect. Not a lot of motivation to connect with somebody like that. But if you are talking to somebody who just gets you, whether it's your best friend or a family member, or maybe think about somebody you grew up with who has all of the same history, community, and context and culture that you do, and so much goes unspoken because they understand. I, I can get behind talking to someone like that. And I love, you. I've got a couple of friends in my life who when we get together, we don't have to say, a whole lot. We could just, we understand each other. And sometimes we tell stories about each other and laugh, but that's a lot of fun. Here's the thing the Hebrew writer is telling us. Jesus gets it. He understands because he was here and experienced all the temptation, all of the struggles, and whatever it is that you're going through right now, I know the things I'm going through. I don't necessarily know all the things you're going through, but Jesus can relate to that. There's not a disconnect. There's understanding and empathy. And therefore, we get to approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Now, God could have said, my throne of power, all oh, my power, right? Or my throne of vengeance or my throne of righteousness. But he says that we can approach his throne of grace with confidence. 
I want us to think about this as our motivation for prayer today, this week, this stage of life. Jesus understands God's throne is the throne of grace. He tells us, be confident when you come talk to me. Because you can. Because I get you. No, so much can go unspoken because I understand you. And so every time this week, when you think about praying, whether it's verbal communication, whether it's your presence with God or with somebody else, whether it's your actions, praying through what you do, try to think about approaching God's throne of grace with confidence because he loves you and understands you. And let's do that right now. Let's pray to God with confidence. God, thank you that you do love us so much more than we're ever going to understand. Thank you, God, that you understand us because Jesus walked in our shoes. And you can not only feel sympathy or compassion, you can feel empathy for each one of us in every situation that we're going through. Therefore, God, help us to approach your throne of grace with confidence. Help us, God, to learn to rejoice always, to learn to pray continually, and to learn to give thanks in all circumstances. And we pray because of and through Jesus, amen. <laughs> amen. Uh, okay, so a couple of quick announcements as we wind down here. So, uh, as always, you can give contribution um, through the Tithely app or online, tithely.com, and you would just search the Nittany Church, okay? Uh, this midweek, as I said before, is going to be 6.30 p.m. on Thursday. 6.30 p.m. on Thursday. And they, I think they don't close until 9. I'm not <laughs> saying everybody's going to be there till 9, but they're open until 9. Okay, so um, let's meet at Tussie Mountain uh, Rec Center at 6.30 on Thursday. And then finally, this coming Sunday, a week from today, is going to be our last summer park service. And uh, we're going to be slinging some barbecue, I suspect. And uh, maybe sling in some more water balloons. I don't know. Or, or something to do with water sports or maybe some creek tubing. Uh, and we might even bring some other sports like um, uh, tailgate kind of games. Okay. So be there at 5 p.m. Pavilion 2. Any other announcements? Uh, it's not on the books, but uh, Saturday, anybody who wants to go to the game fail, let me know. I got free softball camp. <laughs> we got an inside man for the Grange Fair. All right. All right. Well, why don't we uh, have a great fellowship? There are some refreshments and stuff over here, thanks to Tati and Lucas, our newlyweds. And uh, we're just going to be great to be Yeah, you're waiting for the kids. Oh, really? Yeah, that's good.